This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company. For more information and links to all our great podcasts, visit HartmanMedia.com. Welcome to the Young Wealth Show, where you'll truly learn how to make, spend, and invest money for an awesome life. Get the real life stuff that wasn't part of your school curriculum. Young Wealth gives you innovative new ways of dealing with your finances, as well as the skills and tools you're going to need to survive and be successful out on your own. Let the Young Wealth Show be your GPS to take you from clueless to clued in. Here's your host, Jason Hartman, with Young Wealth. It's my pleasure to welcome Thomas W. Jones. He is the former vice chairman, president, and COO of TIAA CREF, the largest pension system in the country, former vice chairman of Travelers Insurance, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, and Freddie Mac. I'm not done yet. His resume continues. He's former chairman and CEO of Smith Barney Asset Management, former CEO of Global Investment Management at Citigroup, former treasurer at John Hancock Insurance Company, and a founder and senior partner of venture capital investment firm TWJ Capital. He's author of the new book, From Willard Strait to Wall Street, a memoir. Tom, welcome. How are you doing? Thank you, Jason. Thank you for inviting me. I have a feeling you are located in either Boston or New York. I'm just guessing. I'm actually between the two. I'm in the New York suburbs, north side. I'm in actually southern New England, and I'm a former Bostonian. Fantastic. Well, I was was just up there. I hosted my mastermind group on a New England and Canada cruise just uh, a week and a half ago. So we were were just there in your area. It's a beautiful fall foliage this time of year. You've just got a a storied career and an incredible resume. Uh, You've obviously done a lot. But what is particularly interesting that we were talking about off air is how you started investing with a conversation with your, your new bride on your honeymoon about saving money to buy two units that you converted into 10 units, right? Well, that's correct, Jason. 25 years old, just married, honeymoon. I told my bride I had some ideas to share and said, in a capitalist economy, we need to think about how to build some capital for investment. And one way to do that is, since both of us are working, maybe we could live on one salary and save the other salary so that we have some investment funds. Now, that sounds easy to do, but it's actually quite hard because it meant that we couldn't do some of the things that our peers were doing in terms of vacations and, you know, nights out on the town and things like that. My bride agreed. And within two years time, we had accumulated enough money to respond to an an ad that was in the Sunday Boston Globe, an ad from the Boston Redevelopment Authority for people to acquire and redevelop various residential properties around town that were in the possession of the Boston Redevelopment Authority. We bid on two abandoned, burned-out brownstones in the south end of Boston. In in 1976, right? 1976. Okay. They were just two blocks from Copley Square in right. downtown Boston. Unbelievably, we were the only people in the entire city of Boston to bid on those buildings. Mm-hmm. Ultimately, we combined it into a 10-unit apartment building. We lived in one unit. And it, you know, it frankly became the foundation of our financial success over the years. That's a fantastic story. And, you know, real estate or really income property, particularly, has just always been such a winner for people. It's really an incredible asset class. I absolutely love it. Now, 1976, that was right at the time that Gerald Ford was moving out of office, Carter was moving into office. In the 70s, there was a lot of talk about stagflation, the misery index. You know, of course, uh, just a few years prior, we had Nixon resign. What was going on in the economy at that time that no one bid on these really well-located properties? I mean, did you have to have a lot of faith and sort of be a contrarian 
to be willing to buy the bid on and buy those properties during that time? 1976 was the early days for the renewal and rehabilitation of the South End in Boston, mm -hmm. even though it was close to Copley Square and close to Back Bay. We already had an apartment in the South End, and so we knew what the potential of the community was. We understood the dynamics of the neighborhood. And so we thought that these buildings, which were relatively close to Copley Square, actually could be commercially viable and an attractive residential location. In fact, a place where we were willing to live ourselves. Right. So I think it was that insight into the market that encouraged us, gave us the, the sense we could move forward with a sense that we weren't taking as much risk as perhaps others might have perceived. Okay, and but those were residential properties, right? You, there were two residential units that you converted into 10 residential units, apartments, right? Two buildings, two brownstones that we converted into 10 apartment units. Mm -hmm. And we lived in one of the 10 units and rented out the other nine, our building was cash flow positive within one year's time. So we were essentially living rent free, mm -hmm. you know, both having then return on our invested capital, as well as the tax advantages that come with owning, you know, commercial real estate, which at that time, you know, tax advantages that could be brought through one's personal income tax return. Right. So right. it really became the core of us just kind of leapfrogging forward economically. Sure, sure. When I asked you about the economy a moment ago, I was kind of talking about the broader economy, 1976. I, I know you mentioned the specific area there in Boston, of course, but what was the feel in the economy back then? Just kind of paint the picture for our listeners so they'll understand how you might have been thinking, like, was this a risky investment? Were you nervous doing that first that first deal? Uh, or, you know, was everything going through the roof? And, you know, you'd be crazy to miss out, right? You know, it's they're, they're well, it was definite. Uh, it was definitely yeah. a sober era. You know, we had just gotten past the resignation of uh, President Nixon in the Watergate impeachment proceedings. Jimmy Carter uh, had just been elected. And this was before the Ronald Reagan era, you know, kind of the sunshine in America era. America was just coming out of, you know, still in the midst, actually, of a period of pretty high inflation. But, you know, my sense, regardless of the short term economic cycles up and down, I had a pretty deep conviction that steady savings and investment every year invested in long term growth assets such as U.S. equity and real estate equity, that that pays off over time. And when you have a dip in the economy, such as we were experiencing in the mid-1970s, it's in fact a buy-in opportunity. And that's especially true, Jason, when you're young. I mean, we were in our 20s. And so basically, I had no fear with regards to if I can get in at an attractive price you know, will this asset eventually perform? I could not predict that it would be a successful investment in a two-year or three-year or four-year time frame. But I was highly confident that as a long-term asset, getting in at the low price of acquiring a property from the Boston Redevelopment Authority, that that would be successful over the long term. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. And I, I totally agree with you. I purchased my first rental property when I was 20 years old. Uh, so uh, it's a great asset class. Talk to us about how Wall Street was back then. What year did you start your, your career on Wall Street? Well, I got started in public accounting in the 1970s. Then I was at uh, John Hancock Insurance Company in the 1980s, where I rose to senior vice president and treasurer, and in 1989 became the executive vice president and chief financial officer of TIAA CREF, the pension company, and became the president of TIAA CREF in 1993. So at John Hancock really was my first day-to-day -day working exposure 
vis-a-vis -vis Wall Street in the 1980s. Yeah, yeah. How has it changed over the years? You know, it, I know you hear the storied stuff about Wall Street, about how they used to have these kind of like white shoe firms, they called them, and how it just used to be a more, maybe a more ethical industry than it is today. Uh, you know, there've been a lot of scandals on Wall Street and uh, the Great Recession and such. Just would love to have your sort of historical commentary on how, how it's been over the years. Well, one of the big changes, I and mean, when you refer to, to white shoe firms, you know, many of the investment banks in that era and brokerage firms were partnerships. And as partnerships, that meant that the owners, the partners, uh, had their own capital on the line. So there was, I would say, a greater degree of caution with regards to you know, their investment disciplines, their lines of business, because losses went directly into the capital account of the partners that owned the firm. Yeah, well, so, that's, know, that's, 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 that's great. And, yeah. you know, uh, I just finished, interesting you bring this up, I just finished a couple of weeks ago Nassim Nicholas Taleb's book, Skin in the Game. Yes. <laughs> and uh, and that, that. that's the problem with the world today, isn't it? There's this uh, disconnect between the principles and the decisions they make. They're going to get their big bonuses no matter what, right? Yeah. Just well, it's, it's highly unlikely, Jason, that the financial crisis of 2008 to 2012 or so would have happened if there had been more skin in the game yeah. by people that owned the firms. You know, yeah. unfortunately, we had evolved to a situation where too many players on Wall Street could grab the golden ring, so to speak, get bonuses of $10 million or more by one year of good performance right. and not suffer any long-term consequences if those assets or investment strategies then turn sour. And that, I think, did encourage behaviors that would not have occurred under a partnership structure. Has any of this been fixed coming out of the Great Recession? Uh, you know, any of the reforms, are they going to work or are we just kind of in the same position. We, you know, we got Dodd-Frank. It's amazing to most people that are outsiders, not insiders, that we had the Great Recession and nobody went to jail. I mean, Dennis Kozlowski, I guess, did. But I think that was even before the Great Recession. But yeah, anyway, you know, what are, what are your thoughts? Well, I think there's been reasonable improvement with regards to the capital levels that have to be held by the firms that engage in businesses on Wall Street, and there are limitations on things such as proprietary trading by the major banks, particularly in those institutions where that could spill over into uh, businesses that are backstopped by the U.S. government, you know, such as uh, consumer deposits that are held in banks and guaranteed by the U.S. government. And I think there's also been pressure with regards to bonuses having to be geared towards longer periods of performance, yeah. that there's a clawback right. two or three or four or five years down the road if it turns out that a bonus that was paid was not justified as the subsequent performance determined. So there have been improvements. I don't think it's as healthy as would have been the partnership environment. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the counter argument is that our financial institutions are able to concentrate pools of capital now at a scale that might not have been possible mm -hmm. under a partnership structure. Right. And so they can support larger investments and larger companies in the broader economy. Right. But, so, but in the uh, aggregate, let's assume that there could be the same amount of capital formation it would just be spread amongst more companies or really more partnerships, if you will, rather than having these giant bohemists that are, hey, I'm going to use it, too big to fail. <laughs> uh, and, and that's a pretty legitimate comment, Jason. And in fact, the most disappointing aspect of the reforms since the uh, crisis is that if anything, our capital markets have become more concentrated mm -hmm. and fewer giant institutions, which we know will have to be supported by the government if they're at risk of failure. So that's a pretty fair point. Yeah, gosh, I don't, I don't know. Every time they make a new regulation, they basically just put up barriers 
to new entrants coming into the field. All the established players, Goldman Sachs and all the rest, they can afford to comply with these regulations. The startup can't do it. It's just funny to me that you have such a startup culture in, say, Silicon Valley. And listen, I have my own complaints about Silicon Valley and tech tyranny for sure. But, you know, the point is there's a a robust startup culture because there aren't many regulations, at least not yet. Maybe that's going to change. We got Facebook uh, in front of Congress all the time and, and probably rightfully so. But on Wall Street, the regulatory environment is so burdensome. That, you know, it would seem like on the face of it, well, that's to protect the consumers, right? To keep everything fair and square. But the reality in practice is that you can't have a lot of innovation. You just got a few big players when you have big regulations, right? Well, you're correct again. The intent was to protect the consumer. But one of the impacts, unintended or not, yeah, right, is that regulation does become a barrier to competition. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the most vivid examples of this, it's easier to understand outside of financial services, that one of the breakthroughs of the firms like Uber and Lyft was that they took this approach, they had enough capital that they could, in effect, just break the law going into business, a regulated business such as you know, the, the taxi yeah, business, right. the taxi and limousine business. Yeah, where, where's your medallion, right? right? Yeah, yeah, where's yeah. your medallion? Yeah, right. And, you know, New York had a regulated number of medallions sure. dating sure. since the Depression. Mm-hmm. And those medallions were worth a million dollars and more yeah. because there was a pretty predictable earning stream mm-hmm. from that scarce asset being out on the streets. Yeah. And Uber, they just broke the rules kind of with an attitude of sue me. Mm-hmm. And they had the resources. Yep. You know, unlike most startups, they had enough scale, really big capital backing them right. that they had the resources. To fight to the fight. Make your market, fight the bureaucracies, yeah. and get enough traction that they could then call on their customers to attack the politicians, right. and regulators, as doing things that were anti-competitive. Okay, so here's the question: Is that good or bad uh, in your eyes? I think it's good, but what do you think? <laughs> well, I think it's good to have breakthroughs like that, like Uber and Lyft. I think it's bad, frankly. I feel sorry, using that same example, I feel sorry for the small businessmen who were trapped, who were caught owning medallions right. with levels right. of debt that they could no longer sustain. I, I agree with you there. So the way to have this kind of uh, you know creative destruction, if you will, is to let it play out more slowly so that people can make adjustments in the markets. Now, I don't know much about the medallion business, but I heard that most of those medallions were owned by big Russian oligarchs, you know, or, you know, kind of have a mafia vibe to them. I I could be wrong about that. And that's true at scale. That's true at scale. So you make it, you know, you differentiate between those who own medallions in mass versus the small immigrant business. Right. One cabbie. Of the small businessman, you negotiate a buyout i.e. Mm-hmm. if the industry is going to change, there has to be kind of a buyout of right. this embedded value. Interesting stuff. And it's amazing to me that Uber and Lyft still haven't made any money. I just can't <laughs> believe that. If they're, with their scale, I, I don't know how you can not make money, but whatever. We'll, we'll see. May, you know, Lyft says they're going to be profitable next year, so, so we'll see. So you're a VC now, a venture capitalist. Now, why did you walk away from all of this other stuff to become a VC? Well, in the autumn of my years, autumn of my career, I understood that, number one, it would be better for my physical health to get out of the Wall Street grind. I understood it would be better for my mental health to get away from the Wall Street grind. And frankly, you know, there's a lot about running big companies and big businesses that just isn't fun. I mean, you talk about the regulatory issues. There's also enormous amounts of administration, personnel management that yeah. is just not fun. It's not the fun part of the business. Right. My sense is that what has always set America apart and made our economy very special 
is this creative energy that we have in our entrepreneurial class. And it's just so enjoyable to be around these people that are excited about new ideas. Yeah. You know, their excitement about building new businesses. I mean, it's I just agree. joyful. It's just joyful to yeah. be around yeah. people like that. It's really exciting. You know, I, Tom, I'll tell you, I have few addictions, but one of them is hanging out with entrepreneurs. <laughs> I just like to really, I really, every time I come back from a mastermind meeting or something, I'm just so revved up. It's really inspiring. You know, to know that these are the people that really are changing the world, not always for the better, but they're definitely making an impact on it. I mean, it's it's truly incredible that it's not government, it's actual people that, you know, most of us know that are really moving the needle. It's pretty incredible. People Very with dynamic. a vision and with a passion. It's America's yeah. secret sauce and uh, yeah. it's something we should treasure. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, every time I go to Europe and I was born in Europe, by the way, it just feels like it's uh, encumbered by uh, bureaucracy and old ideas. And I don't know, it's just uh, not an abundant way to think. Like in the US, it's just a much more abundant type of thinking. Uh, Jason, I, that's the you know, perfect example yeah. of how regulation and bureaucracy hamper economic growth mm -hmm. because they create such barriers to new businesses yeah. in many of the European countries. Yeah, it's it's really amazing. You see the the business startup rate in even Germany, right, which would be considered, you know, by far the the great economy of Europe, right? It's abysmal compared to the states. Uh, it's just there's just like nothing going on in these places. You know, yeah, Germany, comparatively speaking, Germany has this great tier of what they call yeah. middle stat. These middle sized companies, which mm -hmm. are integrated into the industrial side of Germany's economy in particular, but very slow on the startup side, though they are trying to remedy that. Yeah. You know, there, well, is, hope... there is a vibrant startup scene in Berlin in particular. Right. I agree. Uh, Berlin is like the Austin of Germany, I'd say, or, or the Silicon Valley. Yeah, yeah. Very interesting. Are there any questions I didn't ask you? Anything you just want to share? I mean, you've just got such a tremendous background. Uh, you know, maybe anything from Freddie Mac or uh, the mortgage market that we could learn or whatever you want to share. Well, you, you could ask me why I wrote a book. Yeah. Okay. Why'd you write a book? <laughs> and and <laughs> tell us about Willard Strait to Wall Street. Well, you know, my picture is on the cover of my book and it's a picture. It was a Pulitzer Prize winning photograph that was on the cover of Newsweek magazine in 1969 of me exiting Willard Strait Hall, which is the student union building at Cornell University. Mm -hmm. I'm carrying a rifle. I have a butcher knife in my belt. I have a war club hanging from my side. Yeah. I just have this. You, you were a radical, right? Uh, oh, boy. I just have yeah. this look of anger and determination on my mm -hmm. face. Yeah. So a lot of, uh, you know, my, my book is basically two stories. One is just my personal story, personal grit and perseverance, overcoming adversity. You know, one of the first in the wave of black Americans going into corporate America rising to the top there. So there's that story. But I also wanted to tell my story as a microcosm of the enormous racial progress that America has made in the last 50 years. I had that gun and I was that look of anger because I was one of those who felt that what had happened in America with treatment of African Americans for 350 years was going to end in our generation, my generation. It had to end in my time, my lifetime. I didn't expect to live very long. I just, it had to end and I was prepared to fight about it. And America, you know, this is, this is just a wonderful country. America, it faced a metaphorical crossroads in the late 1960s. One fork to the left, which meant trying to live up to the founding ideals and creed of this country which meant inclusion and efforts towards racial equality, social equality. The right fork would have meant oppression and suppression of people like myself and others who were involved in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Fortunately, America chose the left fork, and that has led to progress in this country, which frankly could not have been imagined 50 years ago. 
-hmm. If you had described America today to people 50 years ago, they would have said, that's not possible. This country could not change that much. And Jason, I wrote my book in part because our country does not give itself credit for how much we've accomplished. That's really interesting. You hear, and uh, of course the media, it's always sensationalism, right? Because that's what sells and that's what gets attention. But you see a lot of people on TV, hear them on the news, whatever, you know, complaining, the minority side, complaining that, you know, oh, America's terrible. It's so oppressive. And I just keep thinking compared to what? Yeah, I know it's that. not perfect, <laughs> but but just show me, you know, I know they whip out a couple Scandinavian countries probably as a comparison, but you know, by and large, with a broad population of planet Earth, the U.S. is a pretty darn awesome place. That, <laughs> you know, that and, is true. Yeah, in terms of, uh, you know, minority rights and social mobility. I mean, are these people justified in, in their in their grievances or uh, should they uh, be more grateful? Where, where do you what well, you, you know, I sympathize with movements like Black Lives Matters when they complain about these incidents of police violence against unarmed black men. And yeah, that's really, but, I agree you know, with you there. But, but even sure. there, I say, even though that complaint is legitimate, the truth is such incidents happened 50 times more frequently 50 years ago and 100 times more frequently 100 years ago. Right. And so even though it is bad that it's happening even occasionally now. It's not happening that much. The fact is that the reduced incidents represents enormous progress in our mm -hmm. country. And yeah. with human nature being what it is, we're never going to be completely free of mm -hmm. incidents like that. We're never going to be completely free of, you know, some forms of racism. We're never going to be completely free of some forms of hatred. But we should give ourselves credit. To me, it's like when you raise a child, you cannot do it successfully if you always harp on the negative. That right. No matter what the child does, it's yeah. never good enough. Well, you should have done better. I hope you do better. Now, you've got to give encouragement. You, you got to look for the good. Right? You got to see the yeah. good. And yeah. we need to do that same thing in our social discourse in America. We need to recognize and praise the good, even as we acknowledge that which still needs to be improved. And so that was one of my motivations for writing my book. I hope yeah. America can hear that message. Yeah, I think that's a very fair statement, very balanced. Please give out your website. Of course, the book is available in all the usual places. If you want to share a website or... or From Willard Street you know. to Wall Street is where you can find it on Facebook. Great. Good stuff. Well, Tom, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your, your incredible story. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Jason. I enjoy chatting with you. Thank you so much for listening. Please be sure to subscribe so that you don't miss any episodes. Be sure to check out the show's specific website and our general website, HartmanMedia.com, for appropriate disclaimers and terms of service. Remember that guest opinions are their own, and if you require specific legal or tax advice or advice in any other specialized area, please consult an appropriate professional, and we also very much appreciate you reviewing the show. Please go to iTunes or Stitcher Radio or whatever platform you're using and write a review for the show. We would very much appreciate that. And be sure to make it official and subscribe so you do not miss any episodes. We look forward to seeing you on the next episode.